Yeah, good. Okay. Um, yes, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, welcome to this education forum event, uh, Warm Strict Saving, Warm Strict Schools, Saving Schools or Another um, Brick in the Wall. Um, my name is Alex Standish. Um, I'm a teacher educator at University College London um, Institute of Education. Um, and I'm going to be chairing this this debate this evening. Uh, I'll say a few words of introduction and as I think people are still arriving um, and getting online. So uh, the Education Forum, if you are new to uh, our event, and the Education Forum is a group of teachers, academics, parents, and anybody else is interested in educational matters. Um, we meet in person in London um, or sometimes online. And uh, we're, we raise discussions, organize events around contemporary issues in education. We're trying to get our heads around what is happening in education and um, stand up for what we think are good ideas in education. So hopefully we're going to try and do that tonight. Um, we are part of the Academy of Ideas, which is a, um, a charity which um, has a number of other um, forums, such as the, an economy forum, a parents forum, a social policy forum. And it also hosts the um, annual Battle of Ideas conference, um, which is at the end of October, 28th, 29th of October, uh, which includes a strand um, on education. So that takes place in London and is a very lively event uh, at which there are uh, many discussions um, about lots of important issues in the world, including education. So as a separate charity, uh, we just depend on um, ticket sales and donations. So I think um, my, my um, friend, colleague Ella is going to post in the chat some information about uh, making a donation if you, if you would like to. Um, similarly, um, if you would like contact deals, details for the Education Forum um, and the website, then um, that will be posted um, in the chat as well. Okay, and also to note that the event is being recorded and will be available later. Um, so a few words of introduction. Uh, so we, the idea for this forum came about uh, because I think, uh, you know, behaviour in schools has been an issue in the news and particularly um, this uh, culture, which I'm going to call maybe a shift in school culture. Um, it's been in the news in, in schools in Kent, um, in Cambridgeshire, uh, and, and I think everybody is familiar with Michaela School in Wembley and the um, head teacher there, Catherine Burblesing who has been known, become known as Britain's strictest headmistress. And there was a television documentary made about her. And one of our speakers tonight uh, used to work at the school. Um, so I will introduce him shortly. Um, but also anecdotally, uh, say part of my job, I get to go around uh, a lot of schools and watch my student teachers teach lessons. And that's very interesting. Um, and very interesting to see the, the different cultures in school. Um, but I've noticed a change and I think others have noticed a change um, and many schools adapting, uh, maybe not wholeheartedly warm strict, but um, certainly as aspects of this approach. So what is warm strict? Uh, it's um, an, uh, a theory that comes out of America and particularly uh, being promoted by Doug Lamov. Um, so if you look it up, you can watch his video and uh, it combines um, being warm, caring and nurturing towards children with being strict being clear, firm, and unrelenting. And so not seeing those two things as opposition, in opposition, but, um, you know, but seeing them as, as very much linked, that you are strict because you have, um, and you are, you are caring because you have high expectations and you're not going to let your um, high expectations down. You want um, young people to succeed um, and have high expectations them, themselves. Um, a phrase that I hear um, quite a bit around school uh, is, and some of my students have picked up on, is what you what you permit, you promote. What you permit, you promote. So it's developing a culture um, of, of, of high expectations around behaviour, um, zero tolerance approach to discretions around in, such as school uniform discretions, um, students walking around in silent corridors, uh, having make sure making sure they have the right equipment for class and you might have heard of the phrase slant which means uh, students sitting up listening asking questions nodding their head and tracking the teacher in the class 
Um, some benefits of this approach, which um, advocates um, speak of. Uh, clearly, it means teachers being in, in charge, very clear leadership, um, orderly classrooms, pupils following rules, being polite to teachers, completing homework, uh, and certainly um, that we can find several examples of schools uh, in the country that have uh, had a, a significant turnaround in their fortune. So schools that perhaps were failing, they've been taken over um, and, you know, warm strict or some aspect of it combined with other um, leadership changes has led to uh, a, a transformation in their, in their um, success and their culture and, um, and in their exam results. So what's not to like about all that? On the other hand, critics will say, well, um, what about students uh, who, for good reason, cannot, uh, cannot conform to the rules? They can't follow the rules. Um, are, are schools being overly harsh? Uh, that, um, you know, in marching children around in silence, um, putting them in, in um, solitary detentions uh, for misdemeanors, uh, aren't they um, neglecting their social emotion, emotional development? Um, you know, is this a bit of a militarization um, of schools? Um, and, you know, shouldn't parents have a say? We're going to hear from um, somebody who's an uh, a, a advocate for a, a parents forum um, for, a, for a school in St. Ives. Um, so shouldn't parents have a say? You know, their schools are part of their community. Parents and, um, you know, schools, shouldn't they be working together? Um, you know, what's their role in this? Um, and, you know, it is, I guess, another question for me is, well, what about where does where does this fit into education? We're talking about behavior, but how do we how do we marry? How do we marry a, a discussion, a focus on behavior um, with educational success? You know, they, they, the two shouldn't be seen as separate, but how do we develop, develop a culture which is conducive to uh, to education? Um, before we before we, I hand over to my speakers, just a couple of statistics. Um, I, I guess I was asking the question, is there a behavior problem in UK schools? We're not necessar necessarily gonna answer that tonight, but it does, does present itself as, a, as significant. Um, so a couple of statistics, 77% uh, of teachers, and this is a, this is a um, uh, taken from um, the um, creating a culture uh, um, on, which is on the, Department for Education website, um, Tom Bennett's um, document, how school leaders can optimize behavior. 77% of teachers surveyed reported that student behavior of their school was good or better. Um, and um, Ofsted report that 90% um, of schools having behavior that is satisfactory or better. So that sounds pretty good. We're, you know, maybe up to around sort of, um, 80% or something, 80% and above of schools uh, reporting um, and teachers reporting good behavior. On the other hand, you can find an ATL survey uh, from 2014 saying dealing with student aggression has led to 34% of the teachers who responded um, saying that they had, had, a men had, had caused them to have a, a mental health issue um, such as stress or depression. And 40% 40 40 of these respondents had considered leaving the profession because of um, pupil behavior. So, you know, there, it sounds like there's a problem, but maybe it's a, 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 a uh, you know, it's not the majority, but it's a, a minority. Okay, so I think that is all I'm going to say by words of introduction, other than to say, um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I know the speakers have got things that are coming from very different perspectives. They're also coming from different schools, different parts of the country maybe as well, which might, might um, play into the discussion. But um, um, from seemingly different positions, we're going to try and navigate a way through this and find some um, common ground, I hope. So my speakers um, will be speaking in the following order. Um, Barry Smith is an independent consultant currently, but he's the former head teacher of Great Yarmouth School. Um, and he was a founding deputy head teacher of Michaela. Um, he'll be followed by Dr. Yasmin Finch, who is the chair, or speaking as the chair of the St. Ivo Parents Forum. Um, St. Ivo Parents School is um, St. Ives in Cambridgeshire. Um, this parents forum was set up in response to the taking over of the school by Astria Academy in 2019. Um, and clearly the parents forum has some concerns. Um, Julie Harmison, is the Director of Education and National Strategy 
for trauma-informed schools. Um, so uh, an organization that works with um, uh, a number, a large number of schools across the country. So she will talk to you about what they do and is an alternative approach, I guess, to, to Warm Strict. Um, and finally, Mark Taylor is a um, head teacher at a school in East London um, and has been a member of the Education Forum for some time as well. I'm going to give the uh, speakers, or they've been told they're going to have seven to eight minutes for their introductory remarks, um, and which will be followed by, I might pose them one or two questions, or we might go straight out to the audience, but uh, you know that should leave us plenty of time for discussion from the audience, which is an important part of our education forum. We want audience participation, um, and that will give the, the, the speakers a chance to sort of come back um, and say other things beyond the introductions as well. Okay, so over to you, please, Barry, if you could kick us off. Okay, you can hear me? Everyone yeah. hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Great, lovely. So I'll give you, you my perspective on it, what I do, I work with different schools. The term more strict, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's Doug Lamoff term. I've never actually read the book, um, but if you go to the latest edition of Teach Like a Champion, you'll see my school when I was head, um, charter over in New Yarmouth. Um, that is featured three times because we were particularly good at being warm, is what I would say. I would say to kids and I say to staff, uh, when I'm giving assemblies and so on, I think assemblies and really good communication of what, you, what your values are is very, very important. I think generally schools aren't very good at that. But I say, listen, this is a school that's going to be built on genuine mutual respect. That's mutual. That's two ways. I'm very polite to you. You're very polite to me. I don't ignore you. You don't ignore me. Really simple. Now, we talk about slant and we talk about shape and we talk about steps. There are three acronyms, about 15 behaviours, and it just shows that I'm working with you and you're working with me and we're a team. Now, the adults would always be the team captains. Of course, there's got to be a team captain. Um, we're always going to be the boss. We're very kind bosses. You don't know that yet, but when you leave school, you'll go, well, those bosses were kind bosses. And this is why we do what we do. So um, let's talk slant. So why we do slant, right? Well, what slant is, it's dead easy. When the teacher's talking, because you want to give your teacher 100% undivided attention, because your teacher is where's a gold dust. Your teacher has got thousands of kids or helped Thousands of kids get thousands of GCSEs, really good grades, and we know all the shortcuts. So we're going to show you how to get really good grades. So when you're listening, sit up straight. If you fold your arms, your pens, pencils and stuff, could just push them to the far side just so you don't fiddle, so you can concentrate nice and simple. Um, so you're sitting up straight, your arms are folded, you're not fiddling, that's lovely. Now, I want you to listen carefully, but anybody can fold their arms. It doesn't really mean you're listening carefully. How do I know you're listening carefully? Because you join in lots. You ask and answer lots of questions. That's the A in the word slant. So ask and answer lots of questions. Make mistakes. It's not a big deal, really, because if you make mistakes, well, sometimes I think I've taught something really well. Well, you make mistakes. It means I didn't teach it very well. So it helps me. So never worry about making mistakes. Please don't interrupt, because remember, genuine mutual respect. You've got to be patient. There's 30 people in the room. If you want to say something, great. You just wait for us. And then... We'll call you by name, we'll bring you in. And the final letter T in the word slant means try to teach it. All it means is somebody's talking to you, you look in their direction. You don't pick up your pen and do a little homemade tattoo on your own. You don't look out the window. That's what it is, dead simple. So you train kids in that, you train staff in that. I think sometimes what happens is staff are too extreme. Some staff are very, very lax and they allow kids to ignore them, which again, if you're a secondary school situation, you might see, you might have five lessons, six lessons a day. You're interacting with lots of different adults. If adults are slack and they're not all singing from the same hymn sheet, then it gives kids mixed messages and kids will genuinely misunderstand or they will try and push it a little bit, which is just human nature. At the other end, you've got staff who are very trigger happy. I, I always advocate a system of merits and demerits, and there's a lot of praise and a lot of acknowledgement. At the end of a lesson, maybe 30 kids in the class. Right, the person that gets the golden ticket today is, it's Gareth, because Gareth has done a really good job. I love the way he did this, he did this, he did this. I'll tell you what he did, he was really good at giving shape answers. Remember, in this school, if you want merits, if you want a golden ticket, dead simple, right? If you give shape answers, nice full sentence, had it with me in your mouth, articulate so we hear every single word, big, project your voice to so the whole room here, confident, and 
good eye contact when you're talking to us. That's not eye boring, but you look at us when you're talking to us. Dead simple. So that's how you're going to get loads of merits. Dead easy. You get the golden ticket. There's only one person in each class gets the golden ticket. Now, you might not be that bothered, right? But if you show your mum or your dad the golden ticket, make sure they know that only one person in the class can get it. So you really show them. So lots and lots of praise. I like lots and lots of praise. I like, I don't believe in silent corridors, for example. I want kids to walk single file, eyes front, shoulder against the wall, get their lessons quickly. But I want teachers out. I want teachers stopping kids in the corridor. How are you doing, Johnny? You well? Had a good day. Any merits? Any golden tickets? At Charter, when I was head there, you're going to get bottlenecks and corridors and stuff inevitably. But again, I would train staff. Uh, hello, we've, um, yeah, we've seen to have lost Barry there. Barry, are you with us? Lost me there. I'm back. You got me back. Great. Okay. Yeah, All right. Thanks. So, yeah, so that's Carry essentially on. what I'm looking at. So I explain slang very carefully. Now, I explain that in morning assemblies. I, I, get, I say to staff, look, we need to be explaining it at the start of every lesson. We need to explain um, expectations at the end of every lesson. We need lots and lots of over communication of what we expect. And then if you're going to do this properly, you've got to monitor it. You've got to go into lessons a lot. You've got to jump in and say, Miss Jones, could you mind if I just borrow them for a couple of minutes? And you're demonstrating in the classroom to make sure there's consistency amongst the staff. Because inconsistent staff, they make some, some poor decisions. It will confuse kids. It doesn't give you the ethos that you want. And I want the ethos to be, I talk to all the time with the kids about, listen, this school, we're WWF, we're warm, we're welcoming, we're friendly. How do you know that? You can tell by somebody's facial expression, by their tone of voice, by their body language, by the words they choose to use. We're extra polite. We're not like outside. Outside school is different. Inside school, we're extra polite. It's a place of work, so you have to go out your way to be extra polite. And as teachers, as the adults in the school, we have to model what extra polite looks like. Often schools aren't very good at that at all. Often um, teachers are very ill at ease, a bit scared around children. Break times, lunch times, lesson changeovers. You can see teachers' discomfort um, because children can be quite bullying at times. We want to get away from that. We want to have hierarchy is great. Adults are the boss, adults are the team captain, very kind bosses, and uh, we're there to guide, nurture, and, uh, and protect children. Is my time up or do you need, or do you want a bit more? Uh, you've got you've got another minute, Barry, if you want it. Another minute, but well, there you go. I mean, that's it. I talk about slant. I talk about shape. Shape is just good oral answers. Slant yep. is just being focused. A kid slips out the slant, and you'll say, "Listen, both arms like me, dead simple. Sometimes you'll slip out the slant. Well, that's normal. You're human. You're going to slip out the slant. I'll just remind Johnny. Thank you very much. Good lad. Simple as that. And when Johnny does the right thing, you say, "Good lad." See, in some schools, some kids they may huff and they may puff and they may kiss their teeth, but you didn't because we work as a team. So lots and lots of positive narration of what you're looking for. So it becomes the acceptable norm amongst kids. Yeah, you, you work with teachers. You, you, can, you collaborate with the enemy because the teacher's not the enemy anymore. And in too many schools, there's a real them and us divide, which is, is thoroughly unpleasant. And that's not at all what I want. Thank you very much, Barry. That was um, very enlightening. Great. Nice to hear it from, um, uh, yeah, from a, a, an advocate. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask Yasmin to uh, come in now. And remember that Yasmin obviously is talking about a different school, different context, but I think um, some sort of similar approaches, but we shall see. Yasmin. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, the parent view on behaviourist policies. As soon as a parent first selects a nursery or childminder, and then perhaps if they have a choice, a school, they are making decisions about who will look after their children and whether they are comfortable with how their child is being treated in that setting. They take a view on what the rules are, what the behaviour culture is like, what's expected of the children and how their child is dealt with. I and most parents I know want clear rules that are fair and help their child learn in a calm, positive environment. But what happens when their child starts to tell them they're unhappy or struggling because of the punishment system at their school? Punishments for small things, day in, day out. What if it escalates and they develop anxiety, depression, panic attacks, behavioural tics, IBS, 
UTIs. They see a counsellor, a GP, a therapist. Of course, any parent would go to the leader in that setting and raise those issues, expecting it to be taken seriously. However, over the past few years and the rise in behaviourist policies like SLANT, this has not always been the case. Certainly, in the school my children attend in Cambridgeshire, these matters have not been addressed. As a parent forum of 500 members, we conducted robust research to assess the extent of the problem. We surveyed 350 families with a combined total of over 500 children represented in that data. And it evidenced the conditions above across the student population and their direct correlation with the new behaviour policies at the school. A local GP contacted us, identified they were seeing, and I quote, more anxiety related to punishment at school as opposed to the usual problems with friendship or academic work, unquote. Perhaps the point I would like to raise most strongly in this session is to ask why, when parents do make their concerns known, they are treated with such scepticism by the leadership of schools and academy trusts. It feels like those with the theory are not listening to those experiencing the reality of these measures. There has been much media coverage of parent and wider community reaction when this marginal extreme style of behaviour management is implemented in a particular school. A quick Google shows articles about schools in Essex, Manchester, Devon, Norfolk and elsewhere, where parents have been raising concerns for a number of years now about these methods. Things like children having their food removed as a punishment or being sent to isolation for incorrect uniform. Behind this coverage are parents who are deeply distressed by the negative impact these measures are having on their children. Parents who have tried the normal way of dealing with these matters, but have been met with an unswerving commitment to a theory that is being aggressively implemented. At the start of this year, I had never heard of SLANT or warm strict policies. By the end of March, I'd started a government petition to investigate the mental health impact of them and end the behaviour hub programme that promotes them. Back in January, my children were increasingly unhappy and saying increasingly disturbing things about the new policies the Academy Trust were implementing, like line up in the playground in silence every morning for uniform inspection with their hands raised in a salute-like gesture to senior leadership, or they were anxious they would be in detention for forgetting a spare pen. Of course, some parents feel these kind of measures suit their children, in our survey, 3% of parents felt like this, but 64% felt the policies were having a negative impact on the mental health and well-being of their child. Where there is room for choice, of course, a minority of parents may deliberately choose behaviourist schools and it may work well for them in specialist situations. But this breaks down when schools and academy trusts force a general implementation of these extreme policies. There are other methods that deal with serious behaviour problems in school. Extreme behaviourist techniques are not the only answer. As a parent, I would certainly appreciate our Academy Trust taking a more balanced approach. Do these techniques deal with the minority of severe misbehaviour and bullying that we all agree needs tackling? A youth offending officer who contributed to our research advised, and I quote, I understand there are concerns with disruption in schools, but generally those children that are inclined to this are not really affected, affected by these punishments and just take it in their stride. It will have a bigger adverse impact on those that try hard and make the odd mistake, unquote. What defines success with these measures? If it is only exam statistics, schools and trusts are failing to take into account other vital areas. Tom Bennett, behaviour advisor to the government, identifies five key areas in school life, behaviour, academic achievement, safety, welfare and well-being. Our evidence shows welfare and well-being are being compromised by a singular focus on behaviour. The question must be asked, if a behavioural system has clear evidence of harm to some children, 
Is it acceptable to continue with it for all, even if some parents report it suits their child well? This is what some of our parents said in our research. Parent quote. The system has also caused significant stress, especially for our year seven, who checks his bag repeatedly every morning and every evening in case he's forgotten equipment. His mental health has deteriorated. Our year 10 did the same when the current policy was brought in, but has since lost such respect for the school that she no longer cares. Neither has ever been in trouble. The threat impacts already well-behaved children negatively. Next parent quote. Sunday nights are particularly awful for his anxiety affecting his sleep, which then has a knock-on effect. He suffered with tics as a toddler, and these have returned due to the stress. Next parent quote. There has been an impact on my year 10 child especially. She is well-behaved, conscientious student who feels that through systems such as slant and morning address, she is treated like she's a much younger pupil. And a quote from our student survey. The term slant feels like a dog command, unquote. When issues as serious as these are raised about style of behaviour management in schools, it seems at best incompetent and at worst a serious safeguarding failure if they are left unaddressed. For decades, parents have been happy with normal school rules. They want calm and ordered learning environments, children to feel pride in their education, to get good grades in their exams. But perhaps educational theorists imposing these techniques need to realise that warm strict is still strict and strict is something UK education left behind many years ago. As a parent newly exposed to this enclave of thinking, it has left me asking, has reality been sacrificed to ideology in education? In our Academy Trust, it certainly feels like it has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Um, so you can see we have a debate on our hands. <laughs> um, and um, but some some really good issues raised there. I think you know the, the bit about um, academies um, and you know change in management of school relationship to the you know local school versus locally run schools. Clearly, that's different. And I think some of the um, issues you've had in communicating with your school have been particularly difficult. You brought up the fact that this is you know government policy related to the behavior hub um, and that um, I think your comment about um, have we left strict behind and it seems like some people are trying to bring strict back maybe that's that's uh, getting getting to the heart of um, of what we're discussing here good okay thank you very much um, so I'm going to ask Julie to come in next please good evening it's <clears throat> interesting to come in <coughs> excuse me at this point um so um my organization trains um adults to work and create um whole school approaches that are trauma informed and mentally healthy not just for the children that we work with actually it's really important that that culture applies to the adults as well and um i guess one of the things that i want to dispel straight away when we think about a trauma informed approach is that um it's kind of like the drop curve effect, curb effect. It is um, an, an adaptation to the way that we, we do the everyday business of school that meets the needs of um, a, 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 what may be seen as the few within the school population, but the benefits, it benefits all. A fundamental principle is the creation of safety. And um, when we have children who feel safe uh, and um, supported and in relationship with those around them, then they are optimized to learn academically and emotionally and socially. I'm a firm believer in that we holistically educate our children to be able to live life well. And um, one of the things in the creation of um, psychological safety <clears throat> and, and you know the principle of safety in an environment is um, structure and order and expectation. And one of the myths about a trauma-informed approach, which really does, um, I kind of, I'm getting on my soapbox here, <clears throat> is that um, 
that trauma-informed approaches involve or, or mean that we throw expectation rules boundaries uh, out of the window and nothing could be further from the truth because without those things what we have is an environment of chaos which isn't safe for anybody and then we don't have children who are in the best position to learn and we don't have teachers who are in the best position to to teach so there are boundaries there are rules there are expectations high expectations of behavior and um they are held gently gently on the child but high on the expectations of what we want for them behavior for me and i come you know i speak as a, a previous head of a pro um behavior needs to be taught as a like an aspect of the curriculum and um it's you know for children who haven't had experiences that have built their capacity to self-regulate that um have experiences that have given them such a strong sense of shame if we have children with additional needs whether they are special educational needs and a learning difficulty or whether it's social emotional or mental health difficulties the expectations of slant and shape are out of their reach not because they are choosing to behave in the way that they are but their additional needs mean that it is impossible for them to comply and if we have punitive responses and, and a one size fits all approach to um, behavior and how we respond to misdemeanors or mistakes or um, errors, um, you know, there are that it, it is what we if we're, if we're using punitive approaches, then we add to the shame story. We increase the level of fear and anxiety, which prohibits children learning to the best and fullest of their capacity. Um, so, uh, you know, our approaches are informed by a very robust evidence base of the neurobiology of shame and of adversity and, um, and, and the evidence base of what really supports and helps is a relational reflective approach. We still have high expectations. And for me, a fundamental principle of how we respond to those children who maybe are not following our hoped for expectations in the school is what do they learn from our um, approach or our response to their behavior? I think that you know, in edu we're educators. And if we think about how we respond to a child who makes a mistake in English or maths or science, what we do is we take the time to look at what went wrong and help the child to understand where their mistakes were, were made, not in a way that shames them. We don't punish them for getting them wrong. We teach them how to get it right. And I, you know, why is it any different about a child who is not able to live up to the the expectations that we have probably through no fault of their own in some children how do we support them to um to 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 be able to um learn about their mistakes so if we punish them for some children if we are putting them in isolation for some children they don't have the capacity to regulate because it's a, through a process of co-regulation. Um, some children don't have the capacity to reflect. And if fear is high in their minds, that compromises frontal lobe capacity and the ability to, to reflect. Some children need the support of an adult to help them first regulate. And it's through the process of co-regulation that we learn to, um, to self-regulate. And then we act, we, you know, we need someone to, to, to be able to help us to think about emotions, uh, what we were thinking at the time, how that translates into our behavior, which bit of our behavior is not okay. You know, this is not about um, not holding children accountable, but it's the way that we do it that really supports them to still think well of themselves, that they, we're not laying on shame on top of a shame story. And that they are safe in the knowledge that we will be supportive and provide and help them with what they need at the moment, uh, whether that's a, an emotional or a physical need, and to um, also support their processes of this bit of the behavior was not okay. What skills and strategies do you need to be able to manage that better? And what is it that we can do as a school to support you to develop those capacities? Um, you know, the, the, 
isolation or you know what whatever they're called i've heard them called reset rooms and um if the child is left alone in isolation you know without someone to help them make sense of what's gone wrong um many of them will not be able to regulate they'll go to the next lesson and i've seen you know two to four periods where a child is out of class and yes you know that it, it will enable those other children to learn and um and for the teacher to continue teaching but for the child who has been and it is often the same child who is isolated as a result of their behavior they're not being taught what it is is, is going to help them to manage better when they return to the classroom and many of them go then to their next lesson to um you know still dysregulated and bounce straight back out again um I think you know it's any any behavior system that really highlights children and shames them so it's public um you know um is it's the same children who are consistently highlighted and shamed further by their inability to follow the expectations of the school there's a high percentage of them ha who have um you know send and a high percentage of them who have a trauma history and if we develop a culture where um, children are supported, if we have a curiosity about what this behavior is telling us and what it is that the child needs in order to be successful, have we got the provision right? Um, and is actually the child's behavior being fueled by their, their previous experiences? And I really hear what um, you know, Yasmin was saying about fear. Children who are afraid do not learn. And um, some children who are, have, you know, have a narrative about being a, a good girl or a good boy, the fear of getting it wrong becomes the, the traumatic event. Um, and if they are highlighted and shamed for you know, not having a pen, um, the, actually the fear, the capacity means I can't learn. I'm not going to optimize my potential. Thank, and thank you, Julie. Can, I, can you wrap it up there? <laughs> I can. Sorry, I could okay. go on longer than Sorry, eight. There, there, are, there are rules here and you have to follow the rules. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for that. That was um, really interesting to hear, you know, the I think the other side of the, the stick there and um, lots about lots of suggestions about how we, I think, how we deal with individuals within the system, um, how we, you know, where's the room for students who have, for young people who have had um, you know, difficult backgrounds and things. So um, and I, I will, when Mark, Mark's our final speaker, I'll bring him in now. Um, but just to say that um, I think we'll uh, give the panel a chance to respond to each other. Um, I think Barry's making lots of notes there. So um, yeah, definitely give you a chance to come back um, on other, other people's points. Okay. Um, Mark, could you um, share your thoughts with us, please? Hello. I hope you all hear me. I was on a bad link at the start, but hopefully this is uh, working. Uh, you've got me down as a head teacher. Uh, I've I've just finished being a head teacher for two years. I was in an interim role, so I'm currently tonight back at uh, vice principal level, and I'm speaking independently tonight, uh, not on behalf of any organisation. Um, so it's it, listening to uh, all the speakers. It's quite interesting, really, how um, little I think that you know schools. Um, the you know the idea that you would leave a child alone um, in a remove room in isolation it, it, that would itself be a safeguarding risk. Uh, that that's not done. Uh, schools monitor uh, children in isolation uh, normally with a member of staff to make sure that they get things like lunch and they get on with some work. So I just think simple things like that tell me that you. Uh, perhaps need to come into school more and have more of a conversation about what the school is trying to do. Um, and then equally, I think a lot of teachers, um, just as you might be missed by slant or uh, some of the things you've been saying, they'll be, they'll be completely mystified by your language of things like regulation, self-regulate, trauma uh, as an assumption. Uh, and, and they would want to go on with the job of teaching, even though you, I think you want, you know, you say your expectations are high for teaching. At the end of the day, much as I think Barry kind of over formalizes this approach, I would love a teacher uh, to teach my kids 
by saying, oh, can you just follow what I'm saying, please? Don't interrupt me. Uh, stay in an orderly fashion uh, through the lesson. Uh, that's what you want teachers to do. You want them to command the room and have some presence. Uh, but the, the problem with the, the warm, strict approach is actually that despite what you've said, it's not at all confident. Uh, that otherwise, it would just be strict. The reason it says warm, strict is because it's actually quite a lot like you. It's, it wants it to be fuzzy. It wants it to be nice because there's this tremendous fear of children, tremendous fear of education as an intellectual endeavour um, that is just driving the whole system. And that, that's why when you say you want children to be safe, obviously safeguarding is crucial. But what the translation is when you say that you want something to be safe is a low risk intellectual environment. And, and the way that you've presented it means that inevitably, despite what you think, schools are dominated by your kind of language um, increasingly. And that the key function of the teacher as someone that does a bit, I think what Barry was saying, has that intellectual authority and confidence and doesn't apologize for telling children what to do. That's under attack. I mean, you're right, uh, Yasmin, that schools have, have stopped being strict. Um, it, that, it doesn't mean that they needed to be strict. Um, but nevertheless, I'm, what's the problem with strictness? Uh, what's the problem with a sanction or a punishment? Uh, pe pupils do misbehave, and sometimes it very simply needs a correction. And I think most of the, the annoyance you've got uh, with the multi-academy multi trusts, um, you're, you're, in this sense, you're right. There are a lot of policies that are they're just logical. So it's a uh, an action that's a consequence, and it starts at the bottom and it goes up, and if you don't follow the rules, you end up in a, in a sanction-based system. But there's very, very few schools that don't want to support children um, and give them additional support, uh, particularly on things like mental health at the moment, which is, again, a growing industry, really. Uh, but, but that's largely because of the absence of educational psychologists and the failure of the CAMS uh, mental health networks, luckily. So schools are taking on more and more actually of, of your kind of uh, approach and I think some of it they're doing quite well and, and they, do, they certainly don't want any children to fall behind. Um, so I, I, they're my initial responses but I, I just my bigger point about what is happening underneath the system is that actually both uh, warm strict and, you, and uh, trauma and even the, the parenting approach they all come from a rather similar background which is a a kind of uh, psychological or behaviourist approach, Jasmine's right about that, um, that doesn't really have a, a kind of intellectual inborn confidence in the subject knowledge that schools are for. And I, I really worry that that is uh, becoming a kind of blanketed approach across the whole of the education system at the moment, and that the system is increasingly led by uh, technique and a, a consultancy-based approach, really. Uh, which is increasingly short term. It, it, it means that the subjects taught and the pupils that are, are being taught are just supposed to connect psychologically um, and kind of align uh, behaviourally. And that there is that, that space where you see a child being taken forward by a teacher that won't stop questioning them and will not back down until they drive the mind of the child forward into a place that's really uncomfortable. That used to be called education. That isn't seen anymore, in my view, very often. Um, and that, that worries me. Uh, I also think, just to, be, to, to, to come to the end, is that the warm, strict approach, um, much as I actually think it, it, it's, it's pretty decent, really, for, for a working class school, at the end of the day, it's a mass education system. And I'd, I'd love it if we could get the, the kind of nuance and subtlety that is required for every child. But a mass education system is, does require some mass educational techniques. Um, but I, I share your concern that um, it, it misses the spirit and it kills the spirit, actually, of what learning should be about. And it does mean that uh, I would think particularly some children at the top end feel left behind and so on. I'm not sure they would be as anxious as you presented it. Or stressed. I think that that is more of a, an intellectual projection of your own onto the onto what you think is going on in, in schools and children. Um, but but my concern is that everybody is throwing words at children that we that just need to be uh, assumed that they do have the capacity to know and they need to be challenged intellectually 
and that that will lead to a well-organized classroom with good behavior as an expectation. But unfortunately, I accept that not every teacher can do, can do that. And that means you do need uh, policies and, and kind of technical approaches that do address some of those concerns. And, that, and then, then you get the, the outcome of a kind of a very, uh, a school that does feel far too behaviorist. And they, that, that's the bit about Barry's approach that does worry me um, myself. And it, you always feel like that the, the humanist intent of what education is for quickly gets lost and policies do come in and people do feel very quickly that they're not treated as individuals. And, um, but ironically, it's done through a language of support uh, rather than a language of actually we, we want to get you to develop independently, uh, which I think is another uh, sad loss in the current system. Um, and then finally, I just think that although uh, Warm Strict sounds good in a way, it really actually ends up being a very praise focused system. And the praise, the warmth, um, is kind of a denial of love, really, that, 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 that education is supposed to be about, but we're afraid to use that word. Um, and then it, it then becomes uh, kind of very fake. And I think over time, it, it will be unsustainable for any child that's got a brain because they'll realize they're being overpraised um, as well as uh, with this strict consequence. So I'm more worried about the warm bit being uh, falsified, actually. I wouldn't, I don't really mind if schools are strict. I think that children know that and they can deal with it. Um, so, so I worry that we're kind of confusing so many things because we've forgotten really what the goal of the uh, modern school is. And so my final point is that you, the, the, the whole, all of the approaches really, they actually show a kind of contempt for previous understandings of education. And, and it, it's like every five years or so, people get worried that schools aren't working. But as Alex said at the start, schools are actually very well ordered, I think, in England at the moment. And, and some of it is because of all your approaches partly working. You know, it, there's an improvement in focus on mental health. There's an improvement on basic understanding. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, in general, we need to make sure that we focus on subject knowledge and each subject is different and has to be well taught. And that's the way to drive schools back. So you really know who's got difficulties that you need to help. And I worry that at the moment we're reducing things down to a very blanketed approach, assuming everybody needs care and support. And then you end up with, with children very frustrated that they're being talked down to uh, rather than challenged at all. And that will be my fundamental concern uh, Thanks, going forward. Based reflections of the system. Thank you, Mark. Um, very interesting. Um, yeah, I've got written down some questions, but I'm going to um, hold back for a minute. I guess that one would be perhaps about, um, yeah, whether whether you're talking about things as they used to be and whether things have moved on from that. Um, can we go back to that time? But um, anyway, hold that for the moment. Um, so I'm going to um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of the each of the panelists a chance to respond because a lot of things have been raised, um, and then I will come out to the audience. Um, people are putting things in the chat, but uh, I'm not quite ready for questions yet. So uh, let's have each of the panel. Um, if you could come back for you know about a minute um, to respond, and then um, and I didn't say at the beginning we're going to go to eight thirty, so we have um, a good forty two minutes um, in which. Um, this this discussion can um, unfold. Okay, so Alex, before you go yeah. to the chat, uh, before you go to the speakers, sorry, can I just say that I am um, monitoring the chat, and I'll I'll try and reflect some of the the comments that are coming out of there, so that you know if people are missing that, um, we can get a flavour of some of the comments being raised there. So if you come to me later on, I can can throw some of those comments in. Okay, you. we'll do, Gareth. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll go back to the beginning. Um, Barry, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, respond to the other speakers, please. Thank you. Um, I was nodding a lot to what Julie said. Um, a lot of my values would be, certainly the first part of what Julie was saying, I'm, yeah, it, it made a lot of sense to me. Um, listen, well, the kind of, the, the negative scenarios that both Yasmin and Judy described sound terrific, and it's nothing that I would advocate. I think you can be very careful referencing Googling the press. Google me, I'm evil. Um, but Gareth Sturdy, 
as visited uh, charter when I was the head, so he could tell you what he saw. Spent a day there, arrived early, left late. What, how head teachers are presented in the press isn't really how the schools are. Press are sensationalist. Um, I would say that, um, again, you've got to go into a school and see how the school operates. Um, you can look at school policy, it's typed up policy, it's on the website. The reality of schools and their policy, they're often miles apart. And there's a huge push for PR in schools and in trusts. And so they will market themselves perhaps as we're super strict. Uh, the reality often isn't that. Um, again, I'd have to get Mark to explain a little bit more about, I think he said something about I was overly formalised. Again, he's have to explain that to me a little bit more. And he also raised a point on, I think, losing people as individuals. Again, I'd need Mark to explain a little bit more what he meant by that. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Barry. Um, so Mark can come back in a minute, but let's go on to um, Yasmin, please. Unmute on Zoom, we all remember that. Um, yeah, thank you. I think for me, it was interesting, Julia, uh, Julie picked up on the punitive responses. And I think that for me is, is the issue really with, um, Barry spoke very eloquently about slant and those other techniques. And we can all agree that children sitting up straight, watching the teacher looking like they're paying attention is a good thing. But where it crosses over for me is where there are those very severe punishments very quickly administered um, if that doesn't happen. And I think that's where the children's anxiety and is starting to cause those mental health problems is children living on edge, living in fear. And I know Julie's speaking for a lot of perhaps send children and that trauma, um, children with experience of trauma, but. I certainly want to speak for just your average children as well. We, we've got in our school and in, in, in our data, um, children who are just, you know, have been fine at school, have been doing well, they don't get into trouble, they're achieving well. These policies have come in and they've started to develop anxiety, depression, mental health problems. And we've got the GPs linking them to the, um, to the behavior system at the school. I think I had a question for Mark. I wasn't quite sure on, I'd like some clarity too on when he's, I don't know if it was because his connection wasn't, wasn't mm. so good about, um, he said about perhaps the children, I, I think I heard him say, perhaps the children aren't as stressed as, as we think they are. And it's an intellectual projection, um, which if that was what he meant, I have some deep concerns about because obviously as parents, we know how our children feel. That is our job as parents to look after our children. And, and I hear what Barry's saying about, you know, come have a tour of the school, see what it's like. But the tour doesn't answer the question for parents because the school might look fine. It's when the children come home that they suddenly are saying these things and displaying these behaviors and are sharing how anxious. You can get them to be obedient at school, but that doesn't mean it's not having an impact on them. And it's the parents who are seeing that when they're putting them to bed and it's all pouring out of them as their head hits the pillow. And, and that's what we're seeing in certainly in our parent forum, parents coming together saying, this is happening. And, and an offer of a tour of the school isn't going to answer that question because yeah, they might be behaving fine at school, but it still doesn't mean it's not having an impact. Can I ask, um, I mean, Yasmin and maybe Julie as well, but I think I think I mean I think um, you would agree rules rules you know schools need rules they need to be central to what a school does and I also think you'd agree that um, you know enforcing those rules consistency that's all important um, I think you know I think it's it gets difficult when we talk about stress and anxiety because um, I mean students always have that you know we all went to school we always had those problems um, and we know there's kind of an exponential rise of that um, so I don't I don't think we can pin that on changes I, I can I can see that probably that might have made the situation worse but 
Uh, what I'm getting at, I guess, I think is, is if there are rules and the schools need to be strict, I think we have to accept that some level of that is going to cause some stress for some students. And uh, isn't that something we, sh we need to teach them to live with and manage? Yeah, so, I mean, yes, there needs to be rules. There needs to be sensible rules. As a parent, I want to support the school uh, with the rules that it puts in place. I'm, I've got a doctorate. I love education. I care about, you know, I, I care about my kids' education and I want them to go to school, behave and do well. However, so one example just springs to mind. We had a child whose shirt was untucked, so they got a verbal warning. As they went to tuck their shirt in, the teacher saw their trousers were a bit slouchy. So then they immediately got escalated to an after-school detention. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of rules that parents, you know, your, your supportive parents of school mm -hmm. are struggling to get on board with because that feels like that is unnecessary. That is too mm -hmm. much and too heavy handed. And mm -hmm. I want to come back to you, Alex, about the um, anxiety, yes, post-COVID, and just in general, we know children struggle with anxiety and, and all these ailments. But I, I do think you have to listen when parents and when children are saying, it's because of, if parents, see, we've seen a change in our school. And so we've been able to track that change in our children, children who were settled, happy, going to school, achieving, developing anxiety and articulating or displaying behavioral. Um, so we've got children, like I read out, double checking their bag, triple checking their bag, um, coming downstairs at night at 11 o'clock at night, we've put them to bed but they're coming back down because they're nervous about their bag and they're worried they won't have their stuff and then they'll get a detention and repetitive behavior, leaving notes around the house for themselves. That's all in our data and it yeah, is yeah. directly linked. And I, I think that's why I wanted to raise why aren't parents being listened to? We're mm. saying these things and, and being dismissed as well. All kids have anxiety. Mm. Well, all kids need rules and, you know, some might find it stressful, but I do think this situation is different. And that's why as a parent forum, we went out and got the data because we didn't want to go to the school on hearsay. We wanted to go on hard, robust data that we'd gathered. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think where you've got a really strong point is about the involvement of parents. And I think if there's a change in school culture, you need parents on board. Okay. And I think, and I think, so I, I think, yeah, if you're going to have a shift, then I think parents, um, I mean, obviously at the end of the day, school the teachers got to run the school, but I think, you know, parents need to be supportive of that. And you know, the vast majority of parents are not against rules um, and enforcement of rules. So I think if it's, if it's going to be a change, I think it should be something agreed, uh, you know, and, and with, with some parent involvement. So, Okay, um, yeah, I said I'd, I'd get everyone back. So um, can I move on to Julie? Yeah, and I think the first thing I'd like to address is I, I think, Mark, you absolutely misunderstood what I was talking about in terms of isolation. I spend a huge amount of time in school with leaders and with practitioners. And in terms of what I was talking about of, of leaving the child alone, often in isolation or in reset rooms, the children are not, um, interacted with. They're left a task that they have to get on with and nobody helps them to make sense. So I was referring to leaving the child with their mind alone and not helping them to develop the capacity to reflect. Um, I think, you know, if we look at Tom Bennett's report to the government um, or five, six years ago about the characteristics of schools that are effective around behaviour, there is very little that I disagree with there. There is clear expectations that are communicated to children. There are root, relentless routines and there is the, the support of the adults where there are breaches of those expectations. And um, to, to work out what went wrong, um, what the child needs in order to be successful, and, um, you know, that is the, the, the culture, a relational response to um, improvements and a professional curiosity of what lies beneath the problematic behaviour. Um, 22 years in education at every level, in special settings and in mainstream, and I have never met a child who is deliberately naughty. Um, it might be about getting attention, and then we have to be curious about why that is. 
And I think I, one of the things I really wanted to pick up on is, yes, we do need to have a delivery of education and learning that um, is, you know, that, 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 that is kind of, we can't have individual approaches oh. for every child, but we do have an inclusive education system. And it is our responsibility to ensure that all children um, are able to make progress. And if we have children who don't, what is it that we need to put in place um, in order for them to be successful? That is our responsibility. We cannot write off some children because they don't learn the way that we teach the most, you know, the, the big proportion of the, of the children in, um, you know, in our schools, because there's a big proportion of children that's you know that that would fall under the radar in that in in that circumstance and absolutely schools know we have to take the context of the school um and um and 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 it isn't a one size fits all it's about the ethos and values and having relationships and connection and belonging at the center of of how we then are able to teach and educate thank you julie um Mark, so there are a few questions sort of coming your way, uh, people wanting some clarification on some of the things you said, and uh, uh, hopefully your, um, your connection will be a bit better this time. Still there, Mark? Yeah, still here. I've, I've been told by uh, Gareth to get a, a, a mic, but a different mic, but I'm afraid I haven't got one tonight. If, if we were in COVID, I probably would have been all prepped. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, most of the uh, responses to what I said were, were, were had heard me correctly, though. Um, when when it was said that a tour of the school just wouldn't do it, I, I don't mean to just come around and you know be shown around school and you won't really have a conversation. I meant let's have a high quality conversation uh, with between parents and teachers about what it is we're jointly trying to achieve. Um, the problem is there's a lot of parents that need that conversation and and schools are in a hurry. And that's why, you know, that's why we have these, uh, we end up with these formalized approaches because no one's got enough time to talk to each other properly. So there's a, there's a definitely a, a, a something that needs fixing in the way that parents and teachers talk to each other and find the time uh, to work with each other. I can fully accept that. Um, Barry said that I meant that warm strip was over formalized. What, what I just mean that it becomes a technique and it loses any sense of relating individual teachers to individual personalities and in that sense uh, a good teacher should always be able to do that um, and and then and then you address some of the issues that we've talked about with the other speakers because some students feel that they're treated like a machine and, and that it, that doesn't work for every child I think most teachers uh, know that so I, I just feel that warm strict really is is saying that we can't train teachers to have the wisdom to know how to deal individually with each child. And so we came up with a formalized approach like slant. Um, some of the characteristics of, flat, of slant I agree with, but if you do it, if you turn it across the whole school, bizarrely, it, it was the spirit of the school. Uh, at the same time, I agree, you need consistency. So it, it's a tough call on what schools are gonna do. And my worry is that if you drop the focus on what the school is for intellectually, you end up with technique dominating everything, both in terms of things like cognitive load theory, uh, neuroscience, neurobiology was quoted tonight. They're all the application of psychology to school, which should really have be a much more normative environment where we just assume children want to learn and we've got the confidence to teach them. These are all techniques that assume that the system can't do it or that education has got some kind of something wrong with it in the first place and and then things go wrong in that way uh, in terms of the you know I, i'm a parent too and uh, i don't mind if my daughter uh, checks her bag uh, to make sure she's she's ready you know that that's that's part of how you learn to get organized um it doesn't mean i'm not listening to you or, or that um or that children don't have um, you know sometimes take it too far but some of this is just called developing good habits for how you're going to study later on so uh yeah it's true that you you hear more at home as a parent but it, learning the judgment of being a parent is the same as the judgment of being a, a teacher um you know sometimes you you can't deal with every single problem you have to realize that life goes on i'm not i'm not diminishing at all 
the concerns. I'm just saying it's not as uh, simple to do these things um, based on the domestic uh, context at home with what's going on in the school. That That's part of teaching an individual to actually to be institutionalized in a good way because they're growing up to be citizens of a, a largely democratic culture with responsibilities that go beyond the individual. Um, unfortunately, that leads to you know, some transition issues in terms of growing up at home and how parents feel about it. But that, that's, you know, I don't know how you get around that. Um, and I wouldn't want to, um, short of going, you know, to some kind of Rousseauian ideal. Um, so they were my responses um, to what, what, what people said. Thank you, Mark. Can I push a little bit on, um, uh, I mean, you maybe slightly contradicted yourself. I don't, I don't, I think you've got an answer, but you talked about earlier about what well, we, we need schools are mass education and there need to be some conformism and then that, but now you've just talked about the importance of the teachers being able to be flexible and have individualized um, approaches. So there's that, um, but also, you know, I, I've always, I've always um, believed and taught that you know, a teacher needs to be able to control a classroom before you can teach. Before you can teach them, it's like you can, It's like it's basic. You've got to be able to manage a classroom before you can teach them. But obviously, they're not. They're not um, separate. It's the authority of the teacher is related to their their. The reason they're standing there and the reason rules that they have rules in the classroom is so that children can learn. And I think your criticism and um and I, you know or a criticism of law strict is they're not focusing enough on education. It's too as you said, too behaviorist, maybe too technical, we're losing something. And, I, and I've seen classrooms where I think, yeah, it feels very much like it's all about the rules and sort of the learning comes second. But um, how, yeah, how do we, how, I mean, yeah, say you were training a teacher, how would you teach, how would you um, teach them, train them to, uh, you know, manage the classroom uh, and, and be a good teacher at the same time? Yeah, so I think that it's the same point. It is mass education, but mass education still got to create personalities um, and not diminish that. So, uh, and then in, in the classroom, it's a structured approach you need, but you want a warm, inclusive classroom where children feel they can express themselves. So, what I would say to any teacher is, don't don't forget that it's not about uh, the rules. The rules are to get you to educate a young person to become free in their mind um, and that means just don't don't think that the rules are the answer what i think is happening at the moment is um, either through psychological categories in terms of trauma or through behaviorist categories in terms of warm strict uh, everyone's got a system that is in, that does involve applying their own views on the child and the art of education even mass education is to say you will get an education in your subject and it's the subject and how it's organized logically that will determine what goes on in the classroom and i think that's much harder to get people to buy into these days because everybody wants a quick fix and, and what i'm worried about is that the quick fix has now become the only game in town and in fact it's it's connecting really it's not that warm strict is against neuroscience or, or trauma they're actually two sides of the same coin and but neither of them focus on the intellectual development of the child. And that's where your real answer is to how you're going to train a good teacher. Um, and that's really, really hard work on the mind, the support for the teacher in order to make sure that the, the system does what it should be doing, which is developing young people into really mature, responsible adults. And I feel that my language here is just that's, that's all there is to it. And maybe that sounds too simple. But, but that's the harder job of what a school should be doing. Uh, it is mass education. It doesn't deny the personality. And it takes really hard work and, uh, to get the wisdom in the teachers to get this approach to be anything other than a shortcut. At the moment, everyone's going for a shortcut. Thank you, Mark. I think, you know, I th I think there's, there's, you know, there's some good common sense points in there. And I think, uh, you know, I think we could get some of the other speakers to agree with you on aspects of that, um, you know, maybe not all of it, but I'd be interested. So, so maybe um, I'll let the speakers come back in. A, well, well, we'll take some questions now from the audience, um, and sp um, yeah, speakers, you'll have another chance to come back um, and respond to Mark or um, any of the other points that are brought up. But let's 
Uh, I know Gareth's been keeping a close eye on the chat, which um, I haven't been because I've been listening closely to the speakers. So Gareth, you can come and give us a, a summary on the running commentary. And then um, if people want to raise their hands virtually, of course, um, by the through the reaction button, um, then we can also take some um, direct questions as well to, to the speakers. Um, so Gareth, you're, you're next. Great. Uh, thanks, Alex. Yeah, there's been been quite a lot of uh, lively chat going on. Um, Viv has made a number of uh, contributions, um, but uh, one of the ones that stuck out for me was she said it's not normal to to shut up and for, for kids to be made to, to sit in silence. And she's quite shocked to hear that. Uh, she says that context is is all important in this debate, the context of the of that the child and the school is in. Um, and when children show X behavior, then they show that behavior to, to other people. She feels that's really important. Um, uh, several people have been sort of asking um, about the um, data uh, that Yasmin quoted of uh, 500 students. Um, they want to know sort of 500 out of how many, you know, how that data was gathered and so on. Um, just, I think, some questions over the nature of that, that, that data. Uh, John Paul uh, was saying it's the application of the systems and the support of heads where, where potential problems arise. You know, the theory is great, but when it's rolled out is, is where it starts to go wrong. Um, Terry is, uh, is, um, saying that uh, kids are, seem different these days and he thinks that they're being pampered by their parents. It's, it's different to the experience he had when he was uh, at school. Um, Sarah wants to endorse the idea of collaboration and communication with parents. Um, she thinks that's absolutely key. Um, Steve was saying that uh, he thinks we've gone too far with soft skills um, and that warm, strict seems a more balanced um, approach and uh, lots of lots of people in the chat actually I mean basically there's there's more agreement with Mark in the chat I think than than on on the panel um, and I think Justine uh, was one of those that sort of typified um, the kind of response I just find uh, a comment from um, her uh, I'm gonna have to scroll back quite a, a, a long way but uh, she says authority comes from the adult in the room being so and being confident in what their expectations are of their uh, pupils, or or it should do, um, and she's not at all confident that there are magical systems that can be written down, read, and consumed, and then implemented, and you know everything's just fine. Um, and just to say that there's been a lot of uh, talk about Tom Bennett's uh, report, the government sort of behaviour czar, as he's known. Um, ringing endorsements for that from the panel, it seems. Tom Bennett, of course, it is an advocate of the warm, strict approach, worth pointing out. Um, anyway, uh, Alex, um, we've got a number of people that want to ask questions, so back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. Um, right, how do I see the hands? Maybe so if you, if you click gallery. on participants, okay. you'll, see, uh, you'll see the hands up in the panel yeah. there. Okay, uh, right, so we have um, Jen, um, first, please, and then uh, we'll take. I think Ella's got a question too. So, Jen. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks, panelists. Um, so, I work in a um, an, an NGO that works in children's digital rights, and obviously, uh, my dovetailing question with this is: you know, we tend to all speak about what we know. So, the context of individual schools and the type of education and the, the there's the element of the age of education is all different. But one thing that's universal that interests me is that there hasn't been any talk about the rights of the child tonight. So we tend to talk about this very much from the adult perspective and the teacher's perspective and the school system perspective, but across all age groups and across all types of education and every kind of school in the UK, the rights of the child are enshrined in law where do you think that fits into this approach or does it not have a place in you know how you perceive teacher training or what is understood in types of disciplinary and, and behavioral approaches today thank you thank you very much jen that's a great question and i, I don't know i don't know whether we frame it in the rights of the child or the voice, voice of the child maybe um but um 
yeah, obviously children are a part of this. So good question. Where do they come in? Um, Ella. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, it was just, I think it was something that, um, I think it was Julie said, um, that she, forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, Julie, that I'd never, never seen a child that was deliberately naughty. Um, and I mean, I know that I was <laughs> many times. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of jokes aside, I think there's a problem in the kind of message we convey to children <clears throat> as teachers and the adults who are supposed to have the authority in the room, um, that there can always be some kind of excuse for their, you know, you know, for their behavior. Of course, um, there are lots of children who have genuine problems and they have responses to those genuine problems. But there are also um, the same amount, if not more, who are, you know, uh, smart kids who know their way, know how to um, get their way around an adult and who are making decisions to be lazy or to be naughty or to not fulfill their potential. And, and it's not just a kind of Pavlov's dog response to whatever uh, you might call it trauma, I might call it, you know, something a bit less um, uh, extreme sounding sort of behavior at home. But that there's, if we take away the, you know, Barry talked about having mutual respect between um at teacher and student which I think is very important but that has that mutual respect isn't about saying um you know it's about taking each other seriously and I think we do if you you know the message of all this kind of these acronyms of slant or um shape are, are and equally so the kind of decision the flip side of that decision to say that really kids are only um sort of trauma filled vessels who <laughs> need to be protected from any kind of um, criticism or engagement is not taking kids is not taking kids seriously and you know I don't have to tell you you're a bunch of teachers that kids very quickly pick up on that and there was I remember when I was at school we were all it wasn't to do with behavior but we were all learning all these AOI objectives I know this, this discussion has been had in the education forum before anytime anyone ever says an acronym to me I just switched off because it was just it is just the most boring thing that you can uh, use up your hour of a lesson talking to a kid because it's trying to um it's it's a kind of it's a kind of fake interaction and the you know more broadly and we've got this discussion going on with how to engage young boys in relation to Andrew Tate how to engage young girls how to achieve and all this kind of stuff and how do we inculcate sort of social norms and socialize children into um a society as Mark Taylor Mark Taylor was mentioning all of that surely has to be done on a kind of the only way it's done effectively is on an informal basis, which is that you genuinely get a child to want to do that. Um, and that's very different from sort of saying that you have to coach them into a specific way or that <laughs> you have to sort of protect them from all these great traumas that will happen if you um, if you sort of speak strongly to them. So I just I just wondered, you know, Jen Pearson just talked about the rights of the child, which um, makes makes me shrink a bit because um, I think that's going down a sort of quite a dangerous route. Um, but what about actually taking kids a bit seriously, which is to not treat them like it sounds a little bit robotic from both sides, um, that they are just these vessels that are either filled with trauma or to be trained into shape and slant. What what did you what does that mean? Um, Ella, taking them seriously. Well, uh, sorry, that was a bit rambly, but I mean, um, you know, um, get them to get them to appreciate and understand and uh, channel their agency, which is to say, if they are behaving badly, you know, it's pretty clear that you've decided to behave badly, and there are going to be consequences that whether that whether whether that is going into isolation or whatever form of behaviour management you want it to want it to take it's about it's, you know i'm i'm very sort of nervous about suggesting that you tell all children who talk back to the teacher or who are disruptive in class that this is just simply a um an expression of some kind of trauma that's happening at home i'm i'm sort of probably crudely characterizing what um julie was talking about but there's a lot of that around at the moment that all bad you know what what we have to do to solve bad behavior is to increase the presence of you know, um, therapists or child psychologists or, you know, 
uh, social workers in schools. And that's completely stripping kids of any kind of sense of agency that their decisions have have consequences and that's and that is a very good thing that's an empowering thing that means that they can take hold of their future and shape it in the way in which they want um and i think a similar thing happens when you go down this whole kind of slant shape acronym route which is saying you know <laughs> you have to in order to kind of make decisions you have to do it through this very narrow um kind of false understanding of how you relate to it. you shouldn't be, have to have an acronym to get a child to look you in the face I mean, something very wrong is happening if in order to get a kid to make contact, eye contact with you, you have to point at the S-L-A-N-T on the board. Um, there's, there's something going wrong there with that child's understanding of what their actions actually mean. So I suppose I'm talking about, um, I, I think we have been talking about kids in this conversation a bit like, apart from Mark, a bit like they are just these um animals that are done to all the time and in fact you know kids particularly a lot of the naughty kids are a lot smarter than I think we're we're giving them credit for and if they were given that opportunity to realize that sense of agency you might have more productive conversations with them about the important stuff which is the maths or the science or the English you know. Um, okay some um, interesting thoughts there uh, Ella, so um, Ju Julie was shaking her head, so I'm going to let Julie respond to you, um, Ella, and um, then we'll, I think we've got one more question, and uh, we'll come back to the, the panel. Um, I think the bit that I was shaking my head about is that behaviour is not always chosen, and, um, and, and absolutely, you know, I am not implying that all children are filled with trauma, but some you know, experiences shape our behaviour. And actually, our approach is about absolutely tapping into the agency of the child and helping them make meaning. And, um, you know, for me as a, as a teacher, there's curiosity about what the behaviour of the child is showing me. If actually I've got a child who's seeking incidents and upping, you know, um, in terms of the way that they are responding to get some excitement, what are we not delivering in terms of the way the content is being delivered? And um, I guess I'm also picking up a little bit on, on something Mark said that is about um, the pedagogy of what good teaching looks like. And, um, you know, we first have to create an environment of, of safety where children are safe enough to learn. Um, and not every child will have trauma, and um, but some of their experiences will shape their behaviour. And... Um, in reflective practice, which is a big part of trauma-informed practice, um, reflective practice with the child of, you know, um, drawing their attention to what they're doing um, and, and why they may be doing it, promoting their curiosity and, um, and, and, and also, again, holding the expectations of, um, of, of social, social norms and the, um, the expectations of the school and supporting them to be able to follow those. There is consequences and, uh, you know, the, I, I think one of the, the, the rights of the child is around their right to an education appropriate to their needs and, um, and recognising that for some their needs uh, are, are going to be different and we have to focus on um, getting them to a place where they are safe enough to learn first before we can um, you know we need to create that environment that is for children to be safe enough to learn and I'm, I'm not um, you know some children have deeply traumatic experiences and others there are experiences that without support may well um, not be classed as trauma per se but can have an impact on them and the way that they think about themselves. Thanks, Julie. So um, I'm looking for people to respond to Julie there uh, and you know, what we do about students who have um, had traumatic experiences. Where, how is that, how is accommodation made for that um, in schools? Uh, and, you know, maybe Mark or um, uh, Barry, who have been head teachers, can, um, can come back on that. So I'm going to take um, Kevin's got his hand up and Gareth's got his hand up. So two more questions and then back to the panel for their their final thoughts and responses. Okay, so um, Kevin. Um, 
Alex, um, this question is for, I think it's Julie, the person from the trauma-informed background. And my question is this, what's, what's the measure of trauma or what's the definition of trauma that practitioners are using? In other words, is are kids who suffer trauma the exception or the norm in education today? What figure would they put on it? And the reason why I ask that when I've been reading through the literature stemming from America on the whole trauma-informed movement, a few years ago, you noticed that they, they, the, the figure was about one in 20 that they give for a kid who suffered trauma. Then it became one in 15 a few years later. And I noticed now quite a few practitioners are quoting the figure one in three kids suffer severe trauma in education. And the reason why I asked the question is, when you look at the definition, you notice that some say it's when kids were the the you know their parents were drug addicts, or there was violence in the home, or their parents were alcoholics, or there was domestic violence. But in the latest few years, it's interesting where you hear um, all black kids can suffer trauma because they could be victims of racism. And in the last couple of years, I noticed in England, some trauma practitioners say if kids live in social housing schemes, which I came from, for example, in other words, are working class estates, that constitutes a form of trauma. So would Julia or anybody like to try and answer that for me? Because I think it has a big burden on the discussion. If we were saying that kids who suffer severe trauma are one in 20 or, you know, one in 25, I could understand where they're coming from. But if we're seriously suggesting it's getting towards a figure of one in three, then what we're saying is that this is the norm and not the exception and does not have a huge burden on how we approach this question. Thank you, Kevin. That's a fair, fair point. Um, and Julie's nodding with you. Good. OK, um, Gareth. OK, just just very quickly. Um, I've heard it said quite a lot that uh, all bad behavior is just a form of communication. Um, I'd like to hear from the panel if they think that uh, children who are behaving badly are just trying to communicate a need um, or whether children will just behave badly not because of uh, any bad experience just because you know it's a form of having fun entertaining or whatever what do the panel think of that that's a very appropriate challenge thank you very much gareth okay so we're going to go back to um the panel um i think this has been a great discussion uh and yeah i'll perhaps say my concluding thoughts at the end as well but um uh yeah to sum up. Okay, so I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Um, so we'll start with Mark and then we'll work our way back um, to Barry. Um, and speakers, uh, about, about a minute, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, yeah, I, I agree that the this discussion in itself is a model of what uh, an educated society should do. Um, even with our different views. And again, I sometimes think schools mimic this and end up with great caricatures of how we should interact as adults, even if we come from a different starting point. Um, so that with that in mind, I would say, it, are teachers safe today? Are teachers safe to say that a child feeling safe actually is an evasion of what the uh, teacher should be doing? Can you actually say in schools today that the safety of the child is actually not the issue, that it's actually the, the need to learn? And that's why I think there are some, you know, if I say that point, I think there are some difficulties involved in schools at the moment in having a, a genuinely honest conversation about where children are at and what they need. And, and that involves actually that some of them are just taking the mick. Uh, some of them try and work out how they can play the system. And some of them have got very serious problems that need addressing properly. Um, but you can't always work that out. And a blanket approach to trauma, for example, I think in the end could end up mystifying rather than getting the diagnosis that, that for some children is important to kind of address what Kevin was saying and a bit of what Gareth was saying. Um, Julie put a question on the chat for me. Um, am I saying that teachers should be autonomous? Well, ideally, yes. Our 
part of an institution. But am I saying that children should remain silent? Yes, while an adult is teaching or uh, talking, they should be silent and listen, and they should be silent while other people are speaking, just as we are doing tonight. Uh, there's not a there's no mystery about it. If you want to communicate as a human being, you need to listen and let other people speak. And are they not allowed to ask questions? You put well, no, not while someone is speaking. And then when the when the speaker invites questions, you look for taking questions. So it's like that, the, this kind of thing, which is basic teaching. Uh, it worries me if you ask me that because um, it's not a big deal uh, to say you know, students should listen and, and we should all listen to each other. So, so I, I'm worried that those basics of education can get uh, misleadingly portrayed as kind of over authoritarian uh, issues in the system at the moment and that ends up confusing everybody when it's just how human beings learn uh, to talk to each other and from each other and I will leave it there. Thank you Mark okay and um, Julie if we can keep it short please. Yeah, I'd just like to point out, Mark, it wasn't me. It was Julia, who is one of the participants. Um, I, think, I think we have to be uh, careful about what we define as trauma. And, um, you know, the one in three is certainly not a statistic that I'm familiar with. Um, we kind of very much use the, the definition of um, or the, the experiences of trauma uh, that are around poverty um, and uh, the experience of poverty as being traumatic, um, just to kind of address uh, the comment around that, uh, living in social housing uh, is, is not, in my mind, uh, an indicator of trauma. And they are risk factors. They are not inevitable, but that's not certainly a definition that I use. I think that what we've seen is young people who've experienced, actually, um, a very difficult and complex three years, which I think most definitely has had an impact on some children and on um, the levels of anxiety in the home, uh, which is, has impacted um, on the capacity of, of parents to some extent to be uh, present because their minds are scattered as well by their own experiences. And that is not being judgmental or saying they've been neglectful, but that also does have an impact. Um, a, a parent who has not space in their mind to reflect and support around their experiences for um, a child is not, is not neglectful, but it can have an impact. And I think, you know, there's this idea of a continuum that you are either trauma informed or zero tolerance and and that isn't the case you know there is there are that we need rules and expectations and we need approaches that support children to be able to follow that and and to be able to optimize their capacity to to learn um, and generally one size fits all is is not you know for some children it is not going to be helpful. We do have to have an element of a differentiated um, response that enables those who have not yet got the capacity to follow rules and expectations of how we get them there. Julie, would you would you agree that sort of the you know thinking about the language because I think earlier the sort of polarization between an educational approach and I think the increasing psychological psychologization of education is is significant. So would you agree that? Perhaps we should keep the psychology for those students who are have genuine, very difficult, um, you know, mental situations which need specialist attention. I think the psychology of learning, um, you know, is a, is a huge part of teaching. It is, you know, it, it forms the way that we deliver uh, and um, and how um, how children uh, are able to. Uh, internalize, memorize, um, reflect on. Uh, I think it's a, a, a fundamental part of it. I, and I think it's a fundamental part of quality first teaching is understanding the psychology of how um, how people feel safe and how they learn. Um, and yeah, uh, sorry, I should have I should have distinguished between, I guess, educational psychology and um, I think psychology for uh, psychological um, discussions around uh, mental health and well-being. Um, I think, you know, we want all of our children to be mentally healthy and to experience well-being. And I don't think you can just, you know, that is part and parcel of removing the barriers to learning and ensuring um, every child feels safe enough to learn. And it is 
these, these approaches don't just benefit those children that have experienced trauma, they benefit everybody. They also benefit the teaching staff of feeling um, you know, psychologically safe and, um, and, um, and supported. Uh, and, and I think that's that's a part of the culture of the school. And whether you know, for me, whether you call it trauma informed or or or, or not, I think it is um, a, a sign of a good culture that enables everybody to to reach their full potential. Okay, thank you for your answer. Um, and Yasmin. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that. That's been really interesting hearing what everybody's saying and the questions that were coming up. I think my summary would be a plea for some middle ground in this. Uh, I, as a parent who wasn't aware of this very kind of hot debate in education uh, coming into it, it feels very extreme. The policies I'm seeing in the school my children are at feel very extreme. And I know it's not just that academy trust. And surely there is some middle ground. Um, I think I, I agree to disagree with Mark on, I think if parents are saying um, it's affecting their children in a negative way, we need to listen to that. And, and I'm sure Mark, if his daughter was checking her bag in a way that felt unhealthy and um, negative, he as a parent would take action around that as well. Just to answer the questions about our research, uh, when we formed as a parent forum, we had three professional, uh, either data analysts or um, with research experience, people who put together that survey in a very careful way. So it's very balanced. It wasn't leading. Um, five, over 500 children represented. The school is 1,700, around, around 1,700 children. So as a data set, it's 20, 29%. Of, of the school, um, total school children uh, represented, which any statistician would tell you the data set um, to look at um, and to analyze. So uh, we're keen that our research will start the conversation around what is this doing to the mental health, not just, you know, Julie's here representing those children who've experienced trauma, but just your average children in schools where this is being implemented something is happening to them uh, because of where these policies are uh, delivered in a very punitive, very extreme way. Um, we're working with our MP. We'd love to get that and working towards getting our research in front of them so we can start that discussion and hopefully more research will come um, as well in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. I think those are really important points. Um, and Barry, to finish up, please. Got to, we've got to unmute, unmute you, Barry. There you go, sorry about that. A very long time ago, Yasmin mentioned extreme and fast reactions, and she's right, I see that. Um, she talked about the, the shirt and tucked and so on. Um, I think that's because we train teachers very badly, and I think it does relate to that formulaic approach that some people have picked upon that they think that's slant and shape and steps, which I very much advocate as a house style, and I think we need a unified house style. Uh, it's badly taught. It's badly taught and it needs to be retaught and over-communicated, and we need to drop into lessons and demonstrate to teachers this is what we really mean, because some teachers are overly punitive, some teachers are overly lax. Um, Julie talked, a um, few times she mentioned relational responses. I think she means building relationships with kids. Absolutely, great. And what I always advocate is lesson changeovers, break, lunchtime, teaching teachers to be more confident around kids, making relationships with kids, building relationships with kids. Um, otherwise, Again, going back to slant shape steps, it can feel like an off the shelf technique package. I understand. Again, it's poor training. Um, Jen talked about the rights of the child. Well, the rights of the child are, you, I want you to come to school and be safe. I want you to be safe in the corridor, safe at break, safe at lunchtime. Um, learn lots in lessons, leave lessons feeling accomplished, feeling, well, I'm good at this. Um, and again, which goes back to really good teaching. And when you get these techniques right and they, 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 they pervade the entire school, it's quite light touch. It's almost not that consequential because you, you it's just how the school is, that the kids speak in full sentences naturally. The kids project their voices naturally because when they don't use the elements of shape, monosyllabic, inaudible, looking away, 
it's for a reason. Now, Ella said, yeah, so why are children naughty? Well, it's for peer approval very often. If you have a school culture where it's very them and us and the adults are the enemy and you mustn't collaborate with the enemy, it's passive aggressive. You, you're responding, you're kind of working with the teacher, but not really. When I say fold your arms and you don't fold your arms the way I've, I've modeled for you, it's for a reason. When I ask you to put your pen down and it takes you a long time to put your pen down, it's for a reason. You're demonstrating to your peers, I'm not really working with the teacher. And that's indicative of, an, of a very unhealthy school culture, I'd say. There you go. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, thank you. Okay, right. And thank you. And I thank all the speakers for making some excellent points that, you know, this, this debate won't move forward unless we hear from the different people and and we do try and find some some common ground, which I think we've got some. I think, you know, uh, for me, I think the bringing the discussion to, um, you know, the agency of the child, someone said earlier, and how, you know, the education is for them and to help them grow um, as personalities, but in relation to their learning about the world through subjects, I think, you know, we the more we can direct the um, the discussion towards the purposes of education, um, the intellectual, social, moral development of the child, um, you know, I think the better it will be. And I think, you know, where we've got, uh, I, I think we'd certainly need to direct our canons towards the Department for Education. Um, and I think, you know, there is too much um, of a sort of psychological approach coming top down. So, and I think it's being picked up by academies and, you um, then um, you know put into uh, put into place in in ways that perhaps aren't how even Barry would like to see it being done. You know, it's schools. Someone said earlier, schools is about context. We're working with individuals. There needs to be flexibility within in the system um, to deal with that. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. We've overrun by a little bit, um, but um, yeah, I really appreciate Shane's comments and participation this evening. And I hope this conversation will continue. Okay, thank you, everyone, and good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening.